I call this meeting of the Pearland Independent School District Board of Trustees to order on October 10th, 2017 at 4.06 p.m. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Let the record show that Trustees Beegler, Murphy, Floyd, Botkin, and Decker are present. Barry will be absent, and Gooden is on the way. All right. Um, Mr. Fulis, we don't, I mean, we, we have until 5, but if you wanted to, we can do it now for public comment. Would you like to do that? Well, yeah, if you are willing, we are willing as well. So, Mr. Fulis, this is... Uh, the portion of the board meeting where the board receives input from patrons, each person who addresses the board will have minute, uh, five minutes to speak on his or her issue. Because of the topic posting requirements of the Open Meetings Act, board members will not ask questions of the patron and will not answer any questions posed to the board by the patron. No action can be taken on any issue presented during the patron comment sec segment of the board meetings. Patrons addressing the board will be notified when they're approaching the last 30 seconds of their allotted time to speak. Okay, so Mr. Fulis. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by making a correction to what I said last time. I said that no board members other than Mike Floyd had met Kai Shapley, and Charles Gooden reminded me that he went over and said hello when she was here for Mike's swearing in. So sorry about that, Charles. To be clear, though, what I'm asking the board to do is go over and actually meet her and her mom and talk to them in person and try to get to know a little bit more about the people whose lives are being severely impacted by the board's decisions and to see if you really think this little girl is a threat to anyone. In my ongoing attempt to provide useful information on this issue, I'd like to spend uh, my time today presenting some statistics. In 2011, the National Transgender Discrimination Survey revealed that 41% of transgender participants had attep attempted to take their own lives compared to only 1.6% of the general population. Sexual assault was the leading cause mentioned at 64%, followed by physical assault at 61%, and harassment or bullying at school at 51%. Please consider what this means. Of the 41% who tried to kill themselves, a statistic I know you've all heard before, the way they were treated at school was a major factor for over half. A 2014 study from the UCLA, UCLA Law School's Williams Institute confirmed that 78% of transgender or gender nonconforming students in grades K through 12 experience harassment, while 35% experience physical assault and 12% experience sexual violence. <coughs> A later study in 2014 by the MTPC and the Fenway Institute found that 65% of transgender respondents had experienced discrimination in public accommodation settings in the past 12 months. Those that did had an 84% increased risk of adverse physical symptoms in the past 30 days and a 99% increased risk of emotional symptoms. In May of 2015, Transgender Europe reported 1,731 worldwide transgender murders from January 1, 2008 through December 31, 2014 and a recent increase in the number of trans youth murdered. In February 2016, a national survey of over 5,000 students, staff, and faculty, including 695 transgender college students, was performed in Charlotte, North Carolina. The study found that transgender students are at risk for interpersonal victimization in college, including hostility, discrimination, harassment, and violence, at a rate of 30% versus only about 20% for non-transgender students. Findings indicated the existence of relationships, quote, relationships between denial of access to bathrooms and gender-appropriate campus housing and inc increased risk for suicidality, even after controlling for interpersonal victimization in college, unquote. In 2014, experts from 12 states, including law enforcement officials, state human rights workers, and sexual assault victims advocates all agreed that, quote, there has never been a verifiable reported instance of a transgender person harassing a non-transgender person, <coughs> nor have there been any confirmed reports of male predators pretending to be transgender to gain access 
to women's spaces and commit crimes against them, unquote. Obviously, there have been instances of men sneaking into women's rooms, but those men were not transgender. In April of 2016, a prominent child advocacy in Charlotte with well-trained and qualified staff interviewed 536 victims of child abuse. Of them, only 2%, or just 11 cases, involved strangers. Normally, they said, quote, it's a neighbor, it's a family member, it's a family friend, it's someone who is close to the family, unquote. Over the last two years, at least 850 children were interviewed, and the number of tran transgender bathroom assaults found was zero. And finally, the number of Pearland ISD school board members, other than Mike Floyd, that have gone to meet the little girl to whom bathroom access is currently being denied since I suggested it last month is also still zero. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> the Board of Trustees will adjourn into closed session at 4.12 p.m. No voting will take place in the closed meeting. Any action the board which wishes to take as a result of the discussions in closed session will take place after the board reconvenes in open meeting. The board will reconvene in open session at 6.11 p.m. No action was taken in closed session. Is there a motion? Yes, Madam President. I move we accept and approve the superintendent's recommendation for employment of personnel as presented. Second. Okay, I have a motion made by Ms. Beagler and a second by Mr. Botkin. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay. okay. The motion carries six, four, zero against and one absent. All right, um, we're gonna go into the pledge, Mr. Murphy, and then we'll go right into uh, public right. No, we're gonna go to recognition after okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody for the screen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, in and indivisible. All right. I guess we can sit. Yeah. Sit, we'll sit. Yeah, if you will. Uh, I wanted to um, take just a moment of silence. As you know, we, we recently lost one of our uh, students at PHS. And so if you will, just kind of bow your heads and I'd like to take a moment of silence for, uh, silence for that student as well as the, uh, the victims in the Vegas shooting. So. Thank you. Um, while I have the floor for just a moment, um, I get to make comments. So um, I just want to recognize, um, you know, it, it, uh, again, um, you know, it's since I've been on the board, we've had a couple um, kids with issues and, um, you know, a little bit with suicide. And, you know, it is a real issue that's out there. Um, you know, hopefully we as a district, um, you know, we've obviously taken notice. But, you know, my thoughts and prayers go out to the family um, of, of that student. Um, I'd also like to take a minute just to recognize, um, you know, the parents that are here, um, you know, with their students, you know, without the parents, um, you know, being in their life, taking time out, making sure that, you know, um, raising their kids and doing the things that the kids need to do to get through school. Um, and again, m my hats go out to those parents and, um, you know, as a parent myself, you know, just spend as much time as you can with your kids, be in their life, be involved, be involved, be involved in their social media, you know, know what's going on um, in their in their life. So um, and again, uh, you know, without the teachers that we have here at PISD, um, you know, they do a wonderful job. As you know, we were just ranked number two in the Houston area as a school district and number 16th in the state. Um, and my hats go off to all of our teachers and our administration, and I'll leave it at that, Dr. Keller. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move right into public. I mean, oh, no, we're going to do the board recognition first.
Good evening. Before we begin tonight's recognition, our board president, Rebecca Decker, would like to make a special presentation. Good evening, um, board. I would, uh, it's my pleasure tonight to actually, I'm going to be honoring um, our fellow board member, Lance Botkin. He recently completed the Leadership TASB course of study. Uh, Leadership TASB began in 1993 as a way to offer advanced leadership training to experienced board members. It is a nationally recognized as a premier leadership training program sponsored by the Texas Association of School Boards. Upon successful completion of the, this course of study, the recognition of Master Trustee is bestowed on the individual. So now we have Master Trustee Botkin. Uh, Leadership TASB is a highly selective program where normally only one in four applicants is accepted as a member of the class of 36 participants. And over a 10 month period, the class meets five times in five different Texas cities. They hear from nationally recognized speakers, tour a variety of school districts, and conduct personal research on a topic of relevance to Texas school trustees. Uh, class members also represent districts from all parts of Texas with varying sizes of school uh, of student enrollment and varying levels of property wealth. So Leadership TASB asks each of their participants to work a little harder, be challenged with new thoughts, and renew their commitment to make a difference on behalf of the school children and obviously Pearland ISD and the entire state of Texas. So tonight, Lance Botkin joins the ranks of more than 900 LTASB alumni, which is Leadership TASB, and I am pleased to, uh, to present Lance with this certificate as lifetime member in the Now we are honored to have our very own Pearland Mayor Tom Reed here with us to present a proclamation deeming October as Dyslexia Awareness Month. Mayor Reed. And also to accept the proclamation is Ms. Danielle Trotter with the Dyslexia Awareness Committee. You know, I'm always happy to come here because Parallel City Council and the city take Houston Business Journal, and they, on occasion, rank all of the school districts in the Gulf Coast area. And it's great to see Parallel Independent School District climbing up the list and uh, giving everybody else the run for the money. Uh, we are so very lucky, lucky to have this type of a school district in our community, and that uh, it develops in our community people who are very active and very can, can make such great contributions, not only to our community, but also to our nation in the future. So what you're doing is building our world one student at a time, and thank you for doing that. Let me talk a little bit about dyslexia. And uh, I have with me the chairman of the, of the uh, dyslexia a parallel dyslexia organization, and um, it runs something like this. And I'm, 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 I'm in there for the first two paragraphs, and on the third one, I kind of lose out what I was thought I was part of, because there's something, there's something about high intelligence in there. Okay, whereas dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurological in origin. It is characterized by difficulty with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling, decoding activities, and whereas as many as one in five students has dyslexia. Some of the symptoms include, again, to speak later than their peers, has difficulty rhyming or sounding out simple words, reading slowly, and Skipping over words, struggling with spelling, punctuation, understanding, directions, as well as memorizing words and math facts. 
And whereas individuals with dyslexia are highly intelligent, that's where I dropped out, creative and out of their box thinker, but due to reading problems, often, feel, often fall behind other students. These individuals who have talent and productive minds can do, can do, ex, uh, do ex excellent once they are taught to utilize evidence-based instructions. Whereas increased awareness and education are needed to identify students with dyslexia early in the kindergarten and first grade so that early effective intervention can take place. Now, therefore, I, Tom Reed, by the power vested in me as the city, mayor of this fine city of Pearland, Texas, do hereby recognize and proclaim the month of October 2017 as this lecture awareness month in Pearland, and this represents the feeling of our city council and staff in, in the city of Pearland. And I ask all citizens both near and far to join with me in supporting parents, teachers, and organizations who have organized and are providing for the special needs of individuals who have dyslexia. And it is my great pleasure to present to you today this along with a committee of one that who is chairman of many others in our community that are working to make sure that there is adequate action being taken. And uh, I want to tell you how much I think I appreciate how much you are doing to work on the people with, with dyslexia in the school district. And uh, I have knowledge of several others in my acquaintance, and uh, they are very highly intelligent, very creative, and um, they seem to outthink me most of the time. So I think maybe I need to get a little dose of dyslexia myself. Too. <laughs> so let me present this to you. Pearland ISD is home to some of the most talented students in the state. And now comes the time we like to recognize those students for their achievements. Parents, this is your time, so come on up if you'd like. As your student walks across, we'll do a picture at the end. So students, if you'll just wait down there at the end. From four, September 14th through 16th, Pearland ISD held the 6th Annual Livestock Show and Career Expo, an opportunity for students to exhibit livestock and showcase their career and artistic skills. The show raised $18,000 for scholarships and approximately $179,000 during the auction of livestock, art, and culinary entries. Now we'd like to recognize the Grand Champion and Reserve Grand Champion winners from Turner High School, the Grand Champion Steer and Grand Champion Showmanship winner, Zachary Wagner. From Pearland High School, reserve, grand, uh, reserve Champion Steer, Emily Albright. From Turner College and Career High School, Grand Champion Swine, Vaughn Gosrin. From Turner, Reserve Champion Swine, um, Cayman Minter. From Pearland High School, Grand Champion Sheep, Grand Champion Goat, and Lamb Showmanship Champion, wow, Cade Tyra. Congratulations. 
from Pearland High School, reserve championship lamb, open cattle showmanship champion, Caitlin Gunnan. From Turner College and Career High School, reserve champion goat, Brady Morgan. Oh, we're missing another Morgan in the audience. Also being recognized are art and culinary competition winners from Pearland High School, art grand champion, Andrew Aguilar. And from Pearland High School, culinary grand champion, Emily Tyra. These students are all assisted by teachers, Amber Campis, Hunter Morgan, Rhonda Morgan, and Jared Lynch and Robert Stiles. So students, we all, and, and Mr. Morgan, come on over. This evening, we're also pleased to recognize some local businesses, individuals, and churches that have gone above and beyond to help prepare our students for this kind of unusual new school year that we've had. First, we'd like to recognize our generous community partner, Texas First Bank. This year, the bank donated over $500 worth of school supplies and backpacks for our students. Representing the bank this evening are Carmen Shepard and Cynthia Rodriguez. And Renee, and Renee Rockers. Our next community partner is Hope Church Pearland. They also have a history of generosity to our schools. This August, Hope Church partnered with Walmart to hold a toiletry and school supply drive for Pearland ISD students. Hope Church collected more than $500 worth of items for students. We appreciate Hope's continued support. And with us tonight from the church's Share Hope Outreach Ministry team is Delana Sowles. And Carmen's part of that church too, yay. <laughs> Carmen, you're just busy. <laughs> Hang on, Carmen, don't go anywhere. Each year, the Vic Coppinger Family YMCA hosts one of the largest school supply drives in the area, Operation Backpack. 
Through the 13th annual YMCA Operation Backpack, Vic Coppinger Family YMCA donated over 500 backpacks and 6,274 school supplies for Paralyzed ISD students who needed the extra help to start the 2017-18 school year. We're extremely grateful for this continued community partnership and the monumental undertaking every year. At this time, YMCA representatives with us this evening are Suzanne Murray and Samuel Gray. Finally, during a First Friday event held in August, the Pearland Chamber of Commerce held a drive to help gather items for our outreach department, such as socks, undergarments, personal hygiene items, and more, to benefit that department and those students. Thanks to this support, outreach was able to start the school year better stocked with items needed for students in need. At this time, we'd like to recognize Chamber representatives, Melissa Washington and Sasha Costa. Thank you very much. And that concludes our recognition this evening. Okay, Dr. Kelly, we are going to go into the public hearing on the report on the financial integrity rating system of Texas. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is an annual report uh, that's required. It comes to us from uh, TEA. And uh, as, as has been our habit for as many years as this has existed, we got a great score. We, we received what is called the superior rating, which is the highest rating possible. Um, I also like to point uh, during this uh, this uh, particular item that uh, Texas Smart Schools also exists with a similar function. They were originally started by the uh, comptroller Susan, I forget her last name, Susan Combs, mm -hmm. and uh, we are rated once again. If you look it up on the under Texas Smart Schools, we're, we're rated as a five-star district, which is a combination of the quality of education compared to the cost. And essentially only 46 school districts out of over 1,000 received that honor this year, and we were one of them. So, Madam President, this gives uh, the opportunity, if there's anybody here, to speak on the first report, uh, just so that that is um, made available. All right. So this hearing is open at 634. If there's any public member that would like to speak to the topic at hand. Going once, going twice. Anyone? Okay. 
So the hearing will end at 6.35. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Madam President, this isn't on the agenda, but I, I, I know that you're very curious about this particular uh, hire. Um, remember that we have a new coordinator of guidance services for the entire school yes. district. Yes. Uh, a new coordinator of guidance uh, services for the whole district. Very important position. You'll be hearing more from her in November, but I see that she is in the audience. So would you stand, uh, Shenda Moore, and be recognized? Hi, Shenda. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Well, uh, yeah, Lance has asked me for an explanation. She's basically in charge of the entire guidance uh, and counseling system of the school and uh, school district. And um, uh, we have much work to do and much work to talk about. And she'll be coming back to us in November. On to consent agenda. Consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move we accept the consent agenda items one through eight as presented. Uh, second pull. I have some pull, please. Oh, you want to pull something? Okay. A five and A six. A5 and A6, Mr. Botkin is pulling. So would you like to amend your motion, Ms. Spiegler? I will amend my motion to approve consent agenda items 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, and 8 as presented. Second. Okay, so I have a motion made by Ms. Spiegler and a second by Mr. Gooden. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay, so that motion carries six, four, zero against, and one absent being Mr. Berry. Okay, uh, Mr. Botkin? Yes, Ms. G oh, okay, all right, Ms. Nixon, all right. Um, on the advanced pay for, let me be the advanced placement merit pay. Yes, sir. Um, I, I guess the, the, the question that, continue to ask myself every year on merit pay is is do we feel like it's working number one and do we um is it incentivizing is, is it doing it's what it's supposed to be what it's supposed yeah. to be doing now if we want to go into a more uh detailed conversation we can with uh, miss giggy who oversees that but as she would point out basically this year and and this is a new high because of the AP incentive program, 99% of the kids who are enrolled in the AP course are signing up for the test. Now that's a far higher percentage than in most school districts because you can take an AP course and then say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take the exam. So by having 99% of the folks take the exam, we have a true measure of how we're doing uh, with each teacher. I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, Margo, or? Almost, almost a 400% increase in the number of students taking the exam. Uh, there was a time in Pearland not too long ago where we had about 10 to 15% of our students taking exams, and now it's 99%, almost every student. Um, the miracle is that we've increased participation incredibly in the last decade, uh, such that it was received national recognition, at the same time maintaining or improving our scores. I don't know another district in the country that's been able to do that. So that's our awesome. teachers are just truly amazing. And if you, the history of AP Merit Pay, the first year we had, we paid out about 40,000 and now we're at quite a bit more. <laughs> so uh, with, with the AP classes, um, get, help, me, help me understand, the audience understand. So when a child takes an AP class and, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but it's, it's really good. But um, what happens, you know, a lot of people don't understand AP or pre-AP, so just give them a little more explanation on that if you don't mind. Advanced placement is college level course curriculum with high school support. So my daughter, funny, she didn't pass the AP exam, but she got credit for the class at this college she went to, so that's, huh. so it's kind of a, you know, uh, I think the yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so anyway, you know, one of the selling points for AP is not only that it provides college credit, and that uh, that's transferable more than any other type of high school credit, more than dual credit. But the other thing is, and 
initially I had to sell this, particularly in my previous district, that it's, it is also of value to kids who may retake the very same course at the college level. Let's say it's physics or something else, but they're exposed to all of it at a college <laughs> level in high school, which gives them a big boost when they take that difficult course again in college. Absolutely. And that's I have a, um, so I've been ta I took AP courses for mm -hmm. four years in high school, uh, freshman year to senior year. Um, and I think that the 390%, 95% increase in the uh, number of students taking, percentage mm -hmm. of students taking the AP test is great um, because there is a lot of reward, as we're seeing. Um, but I wonder uh, the amount that we're emphasizing AP versus dual credit. Mm -hmm. and for the type of students that should be taking AP versus the type of students who should be taking dual credit. Um, from my experience and from the uh, uh, national consensus, it seems, folks who are staying in state for colleges uh, here in Texas should be taking a dual credit program. Uh, folks who are going out of state because AP is more versatile, the transfer of credit, uh, or folks going into honors programs across universities, even here in the state of Texas, they should be taking AP. Um, so the 395% increase, while it's great, and it may be turning a big profit for College Board, is it good for our students? College Board is a not-for-profit organization, first of all. It's considered a non-profit for-profit. Okay. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Where if, if a student asks me, should I take AP or dual credit, it's not a blanket answer. The question is, what are your goals for college and career? And then you can be advised what um, what courses to take. Even taking classes in state, there are some situations where AP is an advantage over dual credit. Again, it depends on your college choice, your career choice, your uh, major field of study. Uh, I, d I can tell you that uh, advanced placement is the best preparation we have for right. college and career. Um, in most cases, it is far more rigorous than your dual credit. Yes, it is. So. so well, Again, it depends on the yeah. individual's choice. I would add this, too. Um, now, of course, I think everybody knows this. Dual credit is much more highly emphasized at Turner and for those who choose Turner. Uh, that's why, you know, there's a huge gap in terms of the uh, outcomes I in AP for both places. But um, what you'll see, and I think Lisa will be showing it later in our presentation, is you'll see a huge spike in dual credit enrollment mm -hmm. as well. Um, so uh, to me, it's it's a picture of both. It's not an and or. I mean, it, it's it's both together. Whether kids are making the right choice, I, I would say, Michael, that the state is slowly evolving towards more acceptance of dual credit within the state, to right. to where if you take certain courses, it is an automatic transfer towards a particular degree program. But that has been very spotty up till now. And some do, some don't. Some will say, yeah, I'll give you credit, but it doesn't count towards your major. Et cetera, et cetera. Well, the same, the same concern is raised with the AP courses because they're so specific. AP statistics may mm -hmm. be yes, uh, very geared for true. statistics major or math major, but not really for a liberal arts major. Um, and so it's really incumbent upon the student who's you know, 16, 17 years old, 15, to know their career path at that point in time, uh, which is kind of difficult. Um, whereas dual credit, you can, you know, I'm, not, I'm not advocating either or. I think there's, there's you know, obviously benefits for both, but dual credit, you can really get your prerequisites out the way prior to entering a four-year college, which would save, at least here in Texas, you know, thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of dollars for mm -hmm. students and parents. And Presses. maybe I'll add this too, Michael, to be in agreement with you. I, I think that especially as Turner has, uh, has emerged, uh, dual credit opportunities at the other two high schools haven't been as highly uh, touted or publicized. And I've wondered if we need to boost a little bit of dual credit at the two traditional schools for those not wanting to go to Turner. Mm -hmm. And the last, last question I have, um, I promise. Uh, okay. It kind of uh, piggybacks off of what Secretary uh, Botkin was saying. Uh, uh, sorry. Former Secretary, Former Secretary, Secretary Botkin <laughs> was saying. I got fired. Master, um, ma Master Trustee. <laughs> Master Trustee Botkin. <laughs> fired. Um, have we seen an increase in scores? Absolutely. Prior to, uh, with consideration of merit mm -hmm. pay. So with merit pay, do scores go up? Way up. Yeah. So without the merit pay, way down. up. It's this year alone, great. we had a 25% increase in the number of fives, and a 21% increase in the number of fours. Wow. Okay. And just two years prior, we had the flip. We had a 25% increase in fours and 20% increase in fours. And so is that just because teachers are working harder? 
because they want the pay or because they have more resources to apply because the program is bigger, it has more emphasis? I like a combination of all the things? There are a lot of factors that go into right. teacher success. It takes time for a teacher to develop the expertise to teach at a collegiate level and have students score at scoring high enough to be what would be considered an A or a B in that college level class. Um, my department has two specialists for high school. I know you've seen both of seen them on your campus when you were at Dawson. And they work directly with teachers. They research every content. We provide support to teachers in a number of ways. The board's been very generous for um, advanced placement training in the summertime. But uh, the AP and Merit Pay has undoubtedly had a, an incredible impact on not just the participation, but on the scores. Um, when we started this program in 2010, the comment from teachers was, there was no way I can get 50% of my students to take an AP exam. And we had very few teachers who actually made that 50% participation, and now it's 99. And what incentives are we offering for students who take the AP? The students, yeah. the best preparation we can have for life beyond high school. We ha and your AP classes, you have the expectation of high achievement, you have the exposure to a rigorous coursework on a collegiate level, and you have the experience and practice with that, and still have high school support. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention, mm -hmm. I know it's in one of Lisa's slides, is she went ahead and calculated the amount saved by parents theoretically by converting, uh, I think, did mm -hmm. you use both AP or dual credit and AP? Uh, and mm -hmm. calculate, I think it was like seven million or something mm -hmm. like that that is mm -hmm. saved. Now, as the father of seven children, yeah. that's a lot of moolah yeah. per kid uh, that, mm -hmm. that you can bypass. For students who want to go to a prestigious college, the AP is the best preparation for entrance. For students who want scholarship, AP is the best preparation for that as well. <laughs> and um, for your coursework on your field, in your major area of study, I would recommend AP. Yeah. I was talking so back, uh, uh, actually mm -hmm. out here before the meeting, uh, and now that I'm in my freshman year of college, I have seen how the AP program has really helped. Uh, all students coming from Paraland, oh, I'm glad to hear that. Paraland <laughs> schools. Um, really, we, we do a great job in this district. I see kids from both high schools, mm -hmm. all three high schools really, at the universities now, uh, really succeeding in areas where kids from other districts aren't doing so hot. So congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that the board approve the full payment and continuation of the AP merit pay for teachers as presented. Second. Okay, so I have a motion made by Mr. Bakken and a second by Mr. Murphy. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay, the motion carries six four zero against one absent me, Mr. Berry. Okay, number okay, six? Yes. And, and, and Miss Nixon's fixed it. Dr. Nixon, I think uh, that's her name. I think she yes, it is. She's fixed to come up, and, and it doesn't surprise me that she figured out all these, the numbers or whatever it was y'all were talking about about the, the m money saved because she likes to crunch numbers, and so um, that's. Uh, She's a number cruncher. There's not that's many good. people out there like crunch Just numbers. One for many. Her times. and Sean Murphy, maybe I don't know. Okay, uh, Dr. Nixon, thank you for for coming up. Um, you kind of the same the, along the same lines, and. I, and you'll see my trend here in a second when, I, when we get done. You know, um, with the star incentive, teacher incentive pay, um, do we feel like it's working? Um, and you just want to get your overall, you know, summary about it quickly um, and how passionate you think we should continue with it. I do think it, it is a good plan. Incentive pay is always difficult because you have people on campuses that aren't teaching a star tested grader subject. Um, so that's that can sometimes be difficult. Um, I think the teachers appreciate it. I think that it has spurred some competition in a positive way sure. um, on the campuses. But I think the way that we've developed um, with the campus performance objectives, so it's not that every campus has to meet a set target, that each campus is meeting a growth that's kind of equitable across campuses. So the, the standard we're gonna set from Silvercrest is gonna be different than the standard we'd set for Lawn. And there's lots of reasons for that, but it gives everybody that same opportunity to, to meet those targets and to earn that incentive pay. You know, I, I would say that it's a little early to judge whether it is, you know, the be all and end all in terms of producing uh, higher results. But I will say this, I was just thinking this the other day, I've been briefed on the new accountability system and it changes every year. 
and Lisa's design of this follows and tracks very carefully what is emerging as the stable accountability system for this year and going forward. So that to me is good news. Uh, that the we'll be able to continue it with, with the new accountability system. St student gaps and student progress, student achievement and post-secondary readiness, mm -hmm. which are all retained in the new system that the legislature just passed. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that, you, you have your list here that's that, that's on here. Is there, is there some, you know, does it does it show on the list where maybe the the incentive pay is not helping? And uh, what's the reason what behind that? I say not helping, but you know, not as more as others. I don't know that it's necessarily the incentive pay piece. Okay, um, it's kind of like I don't think our teachers are working necessarily any harder or they would do less if we didn't have incentive pay. Thank so I, I think that every day, every person on every campus is working as hard as they can. Sure. This is kind of like, you know, yes, we hit our target and I feel really appreciated. Um, you know, it comes out that next school year, of those teachers that come back. Um, and it, like I said, it kind of spurs some fun competition. You know, the, if the math teachers earn it this year, the reading teachers want to work really hard the next year to, to earn it because the math teachers got it the year before. So. You know, while it's not perfect, you know, I'm sure that there's some people maybe that feel like we could design something a little bit different. I think the teachers feel that they are appreciated, that, that extra extra work or those extra hours that they may be spending is, is appreciated. So the, the, the reason I was asking is that, you know, if you, if you look at this list on here, everybody who's getting paid, you know, there's one that just clears out at you, which is Rustic Oak Elementary and, and then Pace. They're on the lower end of how much money they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, there's different factors involved, and I want the public to understand that mm -hmm. there's different factors involved in who gets mm -hmm. what. And so it's not that, that the teachers at Rustic Oak aren't doing just as much hard work. It's, there's different factors involved. And I, mm -hmm. Could you expand on that, please? Well, and part of it is enrollment and size of campuses. You know, Pace is a small campus. And so, you know, with that, there, you know, there's less teachers. And so there's times when there'd be less less pay to some of our smaller campuses. Um, again, it goes back to the campus performance objectives. So the campuses are really competing against themselves. Um, other than the piece that does the distinction designation, uh, that piece of incentive pay compares them to the 40 campuses statewide. But it, it's an opportunity to compete against yourself, that idea of continuous improvement, that what can we do as a campus to get better and set goals for ourselves. You know, one thing I'll add to that. Uh, each year, demographics change within our district, and occasionally that change is significant. Mm -hmm. And I, I, off the top of my head, I'm remembering, for example, with Rustic Oak, mm -hmm. that there's been a significant change in demographics. So even though they have that same goal of marching one-fifth towards perfection, mm -hmm. suddenly the students that they are inheriting that particular year right. are the more challenging students mm -hmm. requiring. Uh, so what I tend to do with this is this is great, but I also just want to look a little bit more at the longevity Mm -hmm. You know, what are they doing over several years rather than just one? Okay, thank you, Dr. Duke. So um, I bring those two things up for a reason, you know, because I got my master trustee status. We had to do a close to a year-long project, and our year-long project was on ESSA, uh, Title II funds, which is keeping and maintaining and recruiting the best staff and, uh, and leadership mm -hmm. on campuses. And we had a large discussion over the past year about, you know, what can we do in, in a, for our leadership and our teachers uh, throughout our state and across the, around the nation because there is a drop and people wanting to be teachers. And so staff development is a big portion of that. And with T-Test coming on board, you know, I, I challenge us as a district to look at you know, I don't know how we could do it. That's up to you guys. But, you know, if a person, because it is kind of rigorous, the T-test is mm -hmm. for a teacher. Mm -hmm. If that kind if of, that teacher is. kind yeah. of. It's not kind of rigorous. <laughs> it's rigorous. Yeah. I'm trying to be polite. Go, okay. Go, well, right. and it was designed that way. I mean, it okay, was designed exactly. to give your master's and so my point, right. my point to that is, is if a teacher meets the expectations, then I think we ought to look at as a district, we give the AP pay. We give the star pay, then 
we, we already see the results, right? We talked about the AP pay. Well, I think we ought to be able to, if a teacher meets their expectations or whatever you guys set forth, that there ought to be some kind of, some kind of pay involved. And I know it's going to cost us more money. I get it. I really do. But I, I will tell you this. I say this to people all the time. Kids don't care. Kids do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the same thing goes for teachers and the leadership. And we have to show our teachers and our leadership that we care about them and that we're just not the head shed. We have to show them that we care about them and we're going we're gonna to back it up. If you're going to bust your butt all day long and go home and grade papers at night when you're taking care of your own three kids, then you know what? And, and you meet all our criteria, then we're going we're gonna to help you out a little bit. You know? And I think we need to look at that as a school district. I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to have to be hard, some hard lines. And, but that's if we lose our teachers, we want the great, greatest teachers, and their insurance ain't getting any better, then, you know, we've got to be able to help them out somewhere. So I, I led to that point because we, we talked about that all year long, staff development, and it's, it's a growing problem. I mean, because they're leaving at 10 years or eight years or going to find something else to do, and I don't want to lose good teachers because of pay. Well, we hear that message loud and clear from this board, and um, we'll be bringing a couple of things to you over the next couple of months that, uh, that help with some of these um, taking care of our folks. Good. Thank you. Have a motion? Oh, yes. Sorry. Get a little excited. I see, see Dr. Morgan out there. He's a doctor in his own mind, isn't he? <laughs> Go. I want to take care of that guy. All right. I make a motion that the board approves the star teacher incentive pay for the 2016-2017 school year as presented. Second. Second. Motion made by Mr. Bakken and a second by Ms. Beegler. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor. Okay, all those opposed. Okay, so we have uh, five, four, which is Beegler, Murphy, Gooden, Decker, and Botkin, one against being Floyd, and one absent being Mr. Barry. Okay, moving on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on this next item, which is uh, on the, the regular agenda, consider approval of naming HGAC assembly rep and alternate. Can I defer to you, Sean? You know a little bit more about what all happens with that. And, and, uh, and, and so you actually had said that you would be the delegate again. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't mind. We, um, <coughs> you know, HGAC, um, they meet every month using uh, Galveston Area Council. Um, and I'm actually the alternate delegate even though I'm the Pearland delegate, I'm the alternate delegate to the board. So interesting enough, when the delegate doesn't show up, then I go attend these meetings on, on behalf of the district. And, um, you know, again, there's city leaders there, um, Houston people, I think Mayor Reed and, and Stacy Adams. But I don't, again, I don't, if, any, if anybody else wants to do it, that's fine. If not, I'll step up and do it again, so. Fantastic job. Thank you. You even yeah. went to a meeting. And Jeff can just stay as alternate. He's not here. That's it. Yeah, I nominate him as the alternate. Okay. okay. So is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion that the board selects Trustee Murphy as our representative and Trustee Barry as the alternate to the HGAC for 2018. Second. We have a motion made by Ms. Beegler and a second by Mr. Botkin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I shall call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay. The motion carries to six four zero against with one being absent, Mr. Barry. Okay. Uh, okay, Madam President, uh, yes, consider sir. approval to adopt a resolution for nominating candidates to serve on the board of directors of the Brazoria County Appraisal District. Um, there are two parts to this. One happens tonight, and that's where you nominate someone to sit on that board, and then. Uh, uh, the second one is that you'll come back probably in December and actually cast votes for the slate of officers right. that are nominated. The way this works, and this is where I'm going to have to, uh, George Annie and myself are going to have to take over from Don Marshall, because if you remember, he calculates all of the votes necessary to make sure that our representative gets on there. And uh, what we'd like to do for tonight is recommend that you nominate Ruby Joe Knight and then between now and, and that final uh, vote, we would, you, uh, la the two years ago, the last time this came before you, we work with the city to ensure our representative gets on there and then with the other uh, entities, 
forget the total number of people that sit on that board, but um, they, w they try to get their own uh, representative on there. Here's the difficulty. I'm probably telling you too much, but the difficulty is that there's 33 taxing entities that are under the county appraisal district. We're the big kid on the block. We're the largest. And so we nominate someone, and it's pretty assured that we'll be able to get them on there. And sometimes we'll take additional votes that we have available to us and use them to help uh, other school district candidates from, from other districts within Brazoria County. So again, I recommend that you, uh, once again, uh, Ruby Joe does a great job representing us. Who, who, who is she? Knight. Miss Knight. Is she here? Uh, she is not, but she's, you would know her. It's just kind of hard for me to vote, and, you know, nominate someone I don't know. When we collected our own taxes, when we did, Carolina ISD had their own tax and we collected them before it went to the county, that was her job. So okay. She was the person that worked for the school district. And yeah. she is, I'm assuming, a person of great character and, yeah. and knowledge. Yes. And, and knowledge. Yeah, that's the knowledge. Yeah. Incredible yeah. knowledge. She's All been right. doing it since we went to the way it d is now collecting taxes. She's yeah. been our representative the entire time. So she went from the role as basic a school district employee into the representative of the school district. I've never heard anything but positive comments made about her and about her representation of us. Um, and the city apparently feels the same way. They also tend to nominate her as well. Right. Let's go to you. Okay, with that, I'd like to I uh, make a motion that the board adopts the the a resolution nominating Miss Ruby Jo Knight as a candidate to serve on Brazoria County Appraisal District Board of Directors as presented. Second. A motion made by Miss Beagler and a second by Mr. Botkin. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Motion carries six four zero against one absent. Mr. Barry. Okay. Madam President, the uh, next item is to consider to approve the schematic design for the district-wide security project connected to bond funds. Uh, for the sake of the audience, this was discussed at length in executive session. For obvious reasons, we do not divulge the security plans of the district. So uh, my recommendation is that uh, based on, on, your, uh, uh, on the presentation in executive session that you uh, approve the schematic design. I'll make a motion that we accept the uh, schematic design as presented in closed session. Second. Okay, so there's a motion made by Mr. Murphy and a second by Mr. Botkin to approve the schematic design for the 2016 bond district-wide security project as presented in the executive session. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay, the motion carries six four zero against. Uh, I, I do want to say something about that. Um, uh, just for the people playing at home, um, it uh, was a very, uh, very proud. I guess is the word. I, I was very impressed. Maybe that man is the word I want to use. Impressed with um, what they've got put forth for us for the schematic design for the district wide security. I feel my kids will be. And the, the, the direction we're going is going to be very, very good for all of our students, staff, and, and everybody involved. Okay. Ms. Dawson, did you get the vote number six for you? Okay. Next on yes, the agenda. Yes, uh, Madam President, next item is considered to approve two days of additional leave for the 2017-2018 school year to address employee needs connected to Hurricane Harvey. Uh, and as I put in the executive summary, a whole lot of folks were affected by Hurricane Harvey, either directly. Uh, I estimate about 8% uh, based on some uh, data that Kim Hocutt has uh, put together, about 8% of employees directly affected. That means major flooding and or vehicle loss. Um, in addition to that, there were employees, of course, who um, helped family members or friends, employees uh, who helped neighbors and so on. And then uh, finally, there were professional employees that uh, are in salary, and so they weren't uh, given additional compensation during the hurricane period, but were on 
site helping in various capacities. For example, our own Mr. Berger over here. Now, um, I've been looking at ways to help and consulting with at least a couple of other superintendents about how to address this. Uh, spe uh, so some school districts are, as you know, in far worse shape than we are. Um, but my recommendation is that um, we are already, we, we grant, the state grants five leave days per year, and then we grant, as do most school districts, five additional days uh, of personal leave. My recommendation is for the 2017-18 school year only that we add two days of leave for all employees. Uh, some might say, well, why don't we figure out which ones were affected and which ones weren't? I think that's a very difficult determination to make. Either you know they may have been personally affected or it may be parents or who knows what. So I think I've proposed something. You know, We can go into the potential costs, which are sort of phantom costs for doing this, uh, if you'd like, I, I've at least written down a few things to get you to think about that if you want to. But anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that and say my recommendation is for two days of additional leave for this year only. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Then in the view of the universal difficulties rendering by Hurricane Harvey and its aftermath, the Board of Trustees approves adding two days of local personal leave for all Pearland ISD employees for the 2000. 17 to 2018 school year only. Second. I have a motion made by Mr. Botkin and a second by Mr. Floyd. Any further discussion, board? Just wanted to clarify. So you're referring as phantom costs only into the f only into the cost of substitute teaching, probably. Well, th really, there's there's three potential costs. One is the cost of substitutes, and if everybody was to use that this year. I calculated that at about $180,000 for the teachers. Obviously, most people are not going to use that this year, and it's a phantom cost in the right. sense that they may or may not use it, and we're just pay we're continuing to pay their salary rather than docking them is essentially what we're doing there. The second type of cost is that um, any time that you uh, – that you aren't at work and it's beyond your leave days, we would otherwise be docking you. And so if you calculate that amount, and I took 2,700 employees because that would affect everybody, multiplied it times two days, uh, and I took an average, um, an average uh, daily rate, and I came up with almost $1.5 million for that. So, but again, as, as you were saying, Sean, and uh, I was saying, it's sort of a phantom cost because a lot of people are not going to use it or they're going to wait and use it in a future year when they need it. Uh, and then the final cost, because I said there was three type, there's sub cost, the cost I just described, which is um, just the not coming to work and being paid for it. Uh, the third cost is, and it's minimal, that uh, when you retire from Pearland ISD, you can cash in your unused leave and you get a percentage of that daily rate. Now, that's a very complicated formula that I don't know. I don't know if anybody in the room knows that off the top of their head. But that is a small cost because there aren't that many employees that go all the way to retirement and then and decide not to use their leave and cash it in. Thank you. So Dr. the leave doesn't expire. No, that sir. It, it stays, stays with you. That personal leave it, remains. It, as long as you stay with Fairland ISD. Right. So leave. Yeah, they're local. Them. They're local days, not state days. Local local yeah. So mm -hmm. if you go to another district, Charles, if you, if you guys go to another district, it. Yeah, it goes away. Yeah, right. Bye so bye. And, and I noticed that we have a policy of five local in five states, so it's 10, it's, it's 10 total, okay. and uh, then, yeah, so I, I was clear on that, okay. Any other discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay, the motion carries, Six four zero against one being absent, Mr. Barry. Lance, I just wanna say, I think that's an example of what you just talked about a few minutes ago. It shows that we care about the employees. We have recognized the difficulties they've gone through in this unbelievable year we're going through. Uh, the next item is the quarterly investment report. That's just for your reading pleasure. I would note that finally interest rates on longer maturities are beginning to go in a positive direction in the economy. Um, we will be talking much more about those related items in November uh, in uh, First, with the audit, uh, Dr. Kelly. Yes. Uh, will that going back to the uh, two days? Will that be uh, an email sent to the teachers and everybody? Yes, I'm sure okay. uh, David and I will work on that and get something out okay. to everybody. Okay. Publicizing that and letting them know that everybody. Yep. 
Uh, so last, or just about the last item on the agenda, second last, is a report on the district student testing accountability results for 2016-17. Uh, you're used to hearing this from Dr. Lisa Thank Nixon. This will probably be the last time she delivers this report what? because as you may know, she is the brand new executive director of special programs for our district. Yes. Whoever's coming in after it, taking big your job shoes. has got big shoes to fill. I'll leave all my PowerPoint to whoever's All right, so we'll take a look at our student assessment results for 2017. So we'll start out by looking at our STAR results. There's some changes for this year six of STAR that I wanted to be sure to share with you as we start. The first piece is uh, House Bill 743 that was passed two years ago requires that the test take a certain amount of time in grades three through eight. Um, the law states that 85% of students in grades three through five have to finish in two hours and 85% of the students in grades six through eight finish in three hours. So as a result, they shortened the test by five to 14 questions. Um, those are questions that are graded in addition to the field test items. So one of the, the things that it does is it makes each question worth more. So that does impact the, the overall percent of the test correct that our students met. The other is that Texas decided to change all of the labels again, uh, both on star performance and on the, the growth measure. So where we used to call it satisfactory, it started out as level two, is now called approaches grade level. So the approaches grade level standard is the passing standard. Then we have uh, what used to be referred to as post-secondary readiness, also called final level two, is now called meets grade level. And our advanced or level three is now called master's grade level. So beginning in 2017, and at least for 2018, because that's the way the new accountability is worded, those are the performance standards or the labels for each of the standards. So when we take a look at elementary, Pearland's in blue and Texas is in gold. So you can see uh, at elementary, grades three through four, in all areas, we were higher than the state average. Also, in the past, uh, the board has asked just kind of a comparison for some of the really high-performing districts that are uh, close to us. And you can kind of see those that are highlighted scored a little bit higher than we did uh, at the elementary level. Then we take a look at middle school. Uh, again, our performance is higher than the state. Uh, one thing I would like to point out with our sixth grade math is that all of our students that are advanced students in sixth grade math actually take the seventh grade star test. So these results being that much higher than the state with just our regular <coughs> students, there's no advanced students in that sixth grade group, really says a lot for, for our teachers working with our sixth grade math students. So that's <coughs> a really outstanding performance there. Uh, again, comparing us to the other districts, uh, in sixth grade math, we still were really strong knowing that in some of the districts, their advanced sixth grade students take the sixth grade math test. When we look at junior high, again, we outscore the state. So you can see <coughs> those results across the board compared to the state. And then again, to our comparison, here's our seventh grade scores, and we're, we're <laughs> really close. Um, and again, here's our eighth grade score. So at, at three through eight, I think there was a, there was a lot to be proud of. Um, again, scoring at the top when you look at all 50 districts in region four. Uh, one of the, the charts that Dr. Kelly likes to look at is comparing our change to the state change. Uh, because as each year they change the questions on the test, level of difficulty on the test, the number of questions students have to get right on the test. So this kind of summarizes our change compared to the state change. And folks, I, we have good news throughout testing, AP and, and STAR testing, but I, I don't want to act as though we're perfect. This slide is an example of where I'm concerned because let's just take reading third. What it's saying is basically uh, we went down four points, whereas the state only went down two. Now, we're way above the state, but essentially what that means is that they're coming closer to us 
And so we want to be careful about that. Is part of that's uh, acceptable because we're so much higher than them that we're going to see a little bit of, um, what's that term, regression towards the mean. Mm -hmm. um, but it does concern me. In, in the past two years, you saw nothing but those arrows. So we do need to be careful about that and work on some of those uh, areas where. Wait, so why are we, is you're saying regression to the mean, so we're going down in terms of percentage well, in every test except for one. And part of it is, like I said earlier, well, they've reduced the number of questions on the test. Okay. Right. But and, and, and they've increased the vigor, if I'm right. Well, yes. it could just because it's more concentrated. So they haven't? They just. The rigor's pretty much the same when you look okay. at the level of difficulty. They have three types of questions, and so those that schematic of, of the test design hasn't changed. But, just but Michael, here's, here's my point. This, as you <laughs> said, the, the rigor of the test changes from year to year. So to me, the reason I had Lisa uh, do this is that, for example, look at the very first one up there on Texas. Texas gave the same test, but throughout the state, everybody's average dropped two points, or you know, the average of the state dropped two points. So I want to measure if the state went up or down, how did we do? Did we go up or down and by what amount? And that's why this slide is valuable to me, is how do we look relative to this column in our column? Yeah, it doesn't. A bunch of these this year, it's like uh, they crept closer to us. And we have to be mm -hmm. careful. It's the first time that I've noticed that in the last. So do we know why that's years. happening? Um, I, I think part of it is, like I said, the number of questions, because where we had students that were, let's say, three or four questions above passing, when you eliminate, like on one of the grade levels, 14 questions, right. you know, each question is worth a lot more. So now our students could maybe have missed two more questions this year, but it's going to drop them to not passing. Yeah. Whereas the other districts that were compared against, they had trouble getting their kids to passing. Does that make sense? Right. And so I'm, I'm not sure that those questions being worth more impacted some of the districts that were at or below the state average, whereas it had a bigger impact on, on us. So, so the, the reason I don't like this image is because if you're just looking at it with a fresh mind, you think that we start at the same place. Yeah. But in reality, we, we start we all start quite in considerably places. ahead. Yeah, in fact, you know, maybe it'd mm -hmm. be better. I'm the one that commissioned this slide and had her do it all this way. But for uh, example, like you know, if, if, as Michael suggests, if we put up there, for example, for Texas, it was a 74% passing rate. And ours is over here on the left is 89%. Right. Right. So it shows we may have gone down by four points, but we're still way higher than the state yeah. uh, on that. We just don't want to make a habit right. of compressing. Mm -hmm. We want to make a habit of staying ahead. Yes. Yeah, because like in fourth grade math, we were at 90%. And the state was at 75. Right. Hey, you know, Michael, um, one of the things that I've always said is, you know, show us the good, but also show us the bad, too. Because if you don't know what's bad, how do you fix it? That's right. Yeah. I mean, so, you know. So those that's grades three through eight. Uh, we also gave STAR EOC, so that's our, our high school students. When we look at Pearland compared to the state, so we outranked. Uh, again, in all five tests. U.S. history, it, we're still ahead. Uh, students really perform well on that, that U.S. history. You know, if you look at what's required to pass that test, it kind of explains the differences in performance when you look at English 1 and 2 as compared to the other three. Um, the standard or the percent of the test correct that students have to get in order to meet that approaches grade level is different. So sometimes this can look a little bit misleading because our English 1 and 2 scores are lower, but there's a much higher standard for passing. Um, when we compare to uh, some of our, our groups, again, it's the same group that we looked at before. Um, you know, we, There's definitely room for improvement, but we also are, are doing well compared to the other high-performing districts in Region 4. Well, I haven't kept track of this uh, the last year or so, but the um, the best comparison is actually to Clear Creek because they have almost <laughs> identical, at least as of two years ago, have almost identical uh, percentage of economically disadvantaged students. And what you'll see, and I, I failed to show this in the earlier slides, but we basically beat Clear Creek in almost every single mm -hmm. job. 
I think there's one on this page that we didn't. Is that right? Yeah, just English two, two and, and two. U.S. history. But but if you look back, if you would, if I show you that, we mm -hmm. I don't have it. There's one every other one. So mm -hmm. these are just just examples. Oh, Alvin. Yep. He crushed Alvin. Yeah. Crushed. Yeah. Get off the <laughs> video. And then again, here's that same chart um, showing EOC and the changes. And I should add about Alvin because I feel bad about saying that. They have twice the percentage of economically disadvantaged students as we do, so it's more challenging. And ELL population, so yeah, a little different. Yes, rightly so. All right, so when we talk about, oh, question, yes, sir. Yeah, do you have a plan for improvement? Always, absolutely. Um, as soon as we get the scores in, the EOC scores we get back at the end of May, just in time for graduation. So Dr. Watson, Noel Gray works with our high school specialist. Um, we've got a really, I think, good plan going in each of the content areas, um, looking to really work with our at-risk population of students. Um, our ELLs, for example, are going to struggle with English 1 and 2. Right. That's also a high standard. With, so with the, all the new technology that we've added in with our bond, right, do you <coughs> – with the STAR test, because everybody's getting the hand on, the teachers have tablets and things like that that we just bought them all. Is that something you see technology being able to help with this uh, in an immediate factor? Or is that? I think they will. I think it's going to take time training the teachers. Um, at part of, for example, for our students that are eligible for the online tests that have embedded supports. Um, those are new, you know, TEA rolled those out last year in November and, you know, everybody playing catch up to try to really be able to maximize the effectiveness. I think now going in, um, I know, for example, Mindy Cooper with English One has already met with the English One and Two teachers to help use the tools. Um, this year that will have a spell check feature for those students that meet that eligibility requirement. So there's a lot of accessibility features that I think teachers are going to learn more about as we go throughout this school year. So, so, yes. so to speak on that for a second, on the um, being able to take the test, who, who's eligible for taking the test via computer? Well, there's the state puts out what they call eligibility criteria. And so we have now they're called designated supports that allow students some extra, really it's just about accessibility. It's not making the test easier, sure. but it's providing accessibility so students with disabilities can access that grade level curriculum. Um, TEA has opened that up even more this year, so it's not just our, our special education students or our 504 students. Now there's supports for our ELL, English language learners, as well as our students in RTI, response to intervention. So those students that we know are struggling may not be identified with a specific disability, but we have documented evidence that despite interventions, our students are still struggling. And so I think this year more than ever, um, more and more students are eligible. Now the thing is, you know, we don't want to just throw everything at every student. We have sure. to make sure that we are using the tools to meet the needs of each individual student. And so I think we're still learning that. I think that, you know, with TEA rolling out so much of it last year in November, once we've started the year and we, we have plans in place for students, that was difficult. Um, I think we'll do a better job this year um, with helping students see those embedded supports throughout the school year. And you know, working to try to provide more opportunities for students to interact academically online. So, on, on within your professional opinion, did, um, did TEA roll this out with it being able to take it via the computer? What was their thought process behind that? As opposed, because are they are they trying to get? Does the student know the knowledge? Right? Mm -hmm. Does they have the knowledge of what they're taking? As opposed to, can they guess correctly? I mean, is that. And, and I think so. I think that they're, they are worried about that accessibility. You know, those students that even though a teacher, for example, can provide oral administration on a paper test, you're, you're still kind of limited. Because even if you have five students in a room, if one student moves, wants to move more quickly, they're just going to go on. And we've totally lost the benefit of that. Um, by doing it online, each student controls it the entire time. Now, the only bad thing is, is the student controls it the entire time. So if you have a student that's not used to it, they may not take advantage of some of the tools they have. The so other thing I'll add to your original question, Lance, is that you know, I, it's, the results have been mixed on technology applied to specific test results. Mm -hmm. you know, but it, it goes beyond that. For example, the College Board has recently inked an agreement last year or so with the Khan Academy, 
Khan Academy is a terrific way to learn things at home that you are not necessarily learn when, when you're at school. Now, and Mike, Floyd might comment on this. I think the whole higher education world is moving towards the online environment. So it's, it's essentially important that before they get there, they have at least some proficiency in the online environment. That's very true. So, so do you see that in the near future the paper tests are going to go away? Well, if you look at what TEA's put out about what they call the next generation of assessments, what they're looking to create is what they call adaptive assessments. So that, for example, as students get more answers correct, it, it goes to higher level questions or if they miss more, ah. then it, so that you, the parents, the school district gets a better picture of what the student's able to do. Um, that has to be done online. There's no way to simulate that with yeah. paper. So I think, you know, if you ask the state of Texas, where are you going? They have said with those next generation, it's going to be online. Um, Dr. Kelly and Mr. Barte and I did a survey because they want to know what is what's out there now in school districts. Are school districts even capable, if they had to do all testing online, able to do that? Um, I think we're fortunate. I think we we could do that. It it would be challenging. I think at first for us to get used to that and a, you know, over a week or two week testing period. But that's what TEA is looking to the future to do is to have their assessments online. Well, yeah, because it, it my, I guess we talked about this also is is getting to be able to disaggregate that data faster, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Once you Instantly. know mm -hmm. immediately instead of it, it's yeah. instant. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. So when we look at accountability, and, and this is the last year with the accountability system we know that has four indexes, uh, we'll move to three domains next year, but we are very excited that Pearland met standard, every campus met standard. Um, when you look at the accountability summary reports, um, for the district in index one, we increased by a point overall, index three increased by two, and index four increased by two points. And so it doesn't sound like much, but it's a, it's a lot of students when you look at all of the tests that we were given across the district. Distinction designations, just a reminder, uh, campuses earn those. They're compared to a group of 40 campuses that are similar in type, size, and student demographics. And so typically in May, we find out for each of our campuses who those 40 campus comparison group schools are. Um, these are the designations. Uh, they, they didn't change this year. We have academic achievement in the content area, so reading, ELA, math, science, and social studies. Uh, student progress, which is our like index two, closing performance gaps comes from index three, and then post-secondary readiness. When we look at how we performed across the state, 52% of Texas campuses earn distinctions, and I am really excited to have 95% of Pearland campuses that earn distinctions. Which is the highest we've had, Ever. and it is awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably prouder of this statistic than almost any stat that we come across, mm -hmm. because as uh, Lisa pointed out, we are being measured against the schools most similar to us demographically. Mm -hmm. And so to be at the best of those schools is a great achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had three campuses that earned all eligible distinctions, uh, Magnolia, Pearland Junior High West, and Sable Pro Middle School. So how did we compare? So again, um, I pull up our, our, our friends and we beat them all. So kind of my favorite, um, but we have Pearland at the top and then you can see campuses that have one or more distinctions and then campuses with all eligible distinctions. So the state had 5% that earned all eligible and our district had 14. Good work. Um, now, and I, I know- Before you, uh, are you moving on to AP? Yes, Before sir. you do, um, I just have some questions on the cost benefit of the STAR test in general. Um, obviously, we're proud of, of what we get for the scores we got. It's important, I guess, for our district and for our community mm -hmm. because a lot of people move here for the specific reasons that we get high grades. Um, but how much money do we spend prepping and proctoring? Well, I mean, in terms of, of prepping, I think the, the big thing, and, and Noelle Gray would tell you if she was here, we don't prepare for STAR. We look at the TEAGS, we unpack the TEAGS, 
we make sure that our teachers are providing the best instruction they can. So we're committed to not teaching to the test, but teaching to prepare. Teaching to the TEKS, because the STAR test does test the TEKS. So if we focus on doing at each grade level what we're supposed to do, the way that they're written, to the depth that they're written, and we provide teachers with the tools to do that well with all of our kids, it's almost like STAR is a positive side effect. Really? That, okay. that we're going to do well, but it's not because we're teaching to the test. It's because we are mm-hmm. we, we have good teaching, good instruction, good planning going on. The reason I ask, um, and I guess this is why you know I, I voted against the merit pay for STAR, uh, is because I really don't believe in a state-issued standardized test. I'd rather much have local control mm-hmm. from this district because I think we could do a better job here in Pearland. Right. Uh, I just wanted to get that on the record. Right. Uh, for we all just don't have a choice. As la- I know, <laughs> we don't have a choice. So I was going to ask that, oh, is there an opt-out program? No. 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 <laughs> no. no. So th- there's no opt-out for individual students nope. and no. parents? Nope. No. Unless but you go uh, to private school. Yeah, go to private school. Yeah. Let me add one thing that I think would that Mike would agree on, and so would Lisa. Um, now, I, I personally believe that there should be a certain amount of state accountability. I'll say that. So I, I don't think eliminating all the tests is a good idea. But... Lisa can explain this better than anybody. The days of testing, I'm sure you've been through this, Mike, the intense personnel needs Mm -hmm. and every other kind of need on testing dates as established by the state is completely ridiculous uh, Mm -hmm. over test security and so on. I mean, the number of people required and all of the procedures are beyond any reason, you know. And if, if nothing else, cutting down maybe on the number of tests and then relaxing a little bit on all the things that that uh, that Lisa and, and as testing directors had to put throughout the district would be helpful. You know, one of the things that I, I, culture and climate of a school district and schools and campuses and, you know, that's the most important thing. And, I, and I've always been a believer kind of what you, what you touched on is, you know, the test is a byproduct of, of that campus. And if the teachers are, are – have the passion and, the, and want to teach the subject matter. And you kept saying teach to the t- teaks, which is goals, okay? So the goals of what's going to be taught in that subject matter in that class. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm real big on, you know, not teaching to the test, like you say, mm-hmm. you know, because that's what we get as a school district. We get most school districts get hammered on mm-hmm. is, oh, all you all do is teach the test. And, and really what, what we're doing in our school district, is it's a byproduct of good teaching practices. And, mm-hmm. and we want to, like I said before, we want to help our teachers become better teachers, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. The one interesting thing to me about the whole thing about teaching to the test is that now having been through STAR test uh, twice now, there is a way that the STAR test questions are asked, right? And so you may call it test taking strategies, mm-hmm. but I know the teachers do spend some time. You got to mm-hmm. be prepared. Sure. For we the bridge to well, star. Sure. Right. We call it bridging to star. Bridging so to as star, we right. get, for sure. you know, so two weeks, three weeks, we start yeah. to bridge it to star. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so when you get a question about you got red apples and orange, you know, oranges and yellow bananas, right? And then they'll ask you a question about the red apples, and that's the first thing that you saw. So human nature is you go to that, right? And so mm-hmm. they did a g- really good job of preparing the students for the way the STAR test mm-hmm. is, 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 is taught, I mean, is, is, is administered, the way the questions are asked. Yeah, and, and if you go <coughs> further than that, because when you take the ACT mm-hmm. or SAT, yeah. mm-hmm. it those, I'm not going to say test-taking strategies, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. ways it kind of shows kids – students how to think along the lines of mm-hmm. and then when they go off to be teachers guess what they have to do they have to take another test to get their certificate and it you know it's a utopian world but you know it's it, it is starts off at you know, I, but i don't like you know saying hey we're going to teach you how to take the test i know? wish right. i wish we didn't have to do bridge to star but it is what it is right, <laughs> right. It's part of the story. now one of the things that's um concerned me for three years now is the writing test Mm-hmm. And the writing test has always been, I, I don't know if it's changed, the format has changed, mm-hmm. it's over the, it has. and It continues to change. It continues yes. to change, right? Yes. And so is there anything that has remained constant, like through, like through, through these years? And, and I'm concerned that that, that is our lowest uh, mm-hmm. performing test. And 
I'll just that, yeah. that's question one. I mean, and, and part of it is remember for some of the grade levels, it started out as a two-day test at, at all grade levels, four, seven, and, and exit. So then they decided, well, that was too much. So now we take it back to one. And then they've been adjusting how much the composition is worth compared to how much the multiple choice are worth. And so in that, it's, it's hard to know what to focus on. I mean, it's a big test. Um, English one and English two is even bigger because it adds reading on top of that. So I think that, I mean, we're not alone in struggling in writing, um, but I think that, you know, that's, that's an area we're really trying to focus on. Yeah. Um, one of the things we're trying not to do is, is create these cookie cutter writers, you know, giving right. these kids a, a template for their composition. And it, so that's not, we know that's not where we want to be, mm -hmm. but how do we help our ELL students? How do we help our special education students that, that struggle with writing to be successful on, on a test like that. And so I think that's something we're always gonna work on. I you know, uh, Charles, this may sound like a cop-out, but to me, that's one of the tests that should be eliminated right. from the state because it's the state does this sort of mechanical procedure with, with graders uh, to grade something as as broad as, as, as a writing test. To me, that mm -hmm. really ought to be Michael suggested for other tests of yeah. local accountability. Not and, and there was talk the that they would give us an opportunity to yeah. do a locally developed portfolio, which is more appropriate for writing. No yes. one in the real world is real world is going to write on um, 26 lines in a two hour time period <laughs> and then do something with that writing. So it's it's kind of an artificial way to assess writing. Right. Um, but they've kind of backed off that, but they're looking at ESA because the federal requirement doesn't include writing. Mm -hmm. And so I know that that's also, mm -hmm. it didn't pass this legislative session, but that was one of the things that was proposed. Okay. So, so what I'd like to, the way I'd like to see it is, is that, because I, I don't get to, to touch and feel like what the plan is for mm -hmm. each campus. I know Ms. Bradley came in and showed us a couple of years ago her campus. Mm -hmm. I mean, the campus accountability plan. Yeah, the Cat. campus accountability mm -hmm. plan. It's an extensive um, student by student, you know, almost uh, type yes. deal. But for the writing particularly, right, mm -hmm. because I come across so many people in the professional world who are, you know, adults and just a, a six-line email, you can't decipher what they were trying mm -hmm. to say. And I, I want to I wanna make sure that what we're doing in our writing instruction is allowing kids to understand. I mean, you, you talk about the ELL and mm -hmm. uh, the, special, you know, the special needs populations. I'm talking about our, our middle kids, mm -hmm. right? Even our 80 um, percenters. High performing, yes. The 80 percent kids. Right, right, uh -huh. that kid. 80 right? percenters. You know, because, you know, texting, you know, Snapchat. No, that, that's not going to get it, right? You're going right. to eventually have to write your boss an email about why I did this, mm -hmm. that, or the other, right? You know, so yeah. So yeah. I, I want to make sure that what we're, what we're moving toward mm -hmm. is, is helping our students being able to express themselves effectively in writing, regardless of what the state. I understand the state test is a moving target, right. but I'd love to see an increased performance there, but I also want to know that outside of teaching to the test, that we're preparing our kids to be able to, to express themselves in writing. Mm -hmm. Hey, Charles, did you know that the SAT this past year just got rid of the writing portion of the test? And it's only, you could do the writing portion for an additional charge. Mm. And it's up to the school whether they it, use that or accept that or not. Mm. It's they're, they're, it's this, that they only had it for about four years. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't, I mean, it, hasn't been very long. it was only around for a few right. years. Well, and then even then, not all universities accepted it. Exactly. Well, or they did it for, uh, you know, certain, certain ones. Right. Yeah. Mm. That's weird. I mean, I just thought that was. Yeah. Like, I, in, and whether it's going to be assessed at the SAT or the st at the state yeah. level or not. That's oh, I a agree necessary with skill that oh, we're I agree gonna have to build in, whether or not they start. Oh, okay. I agree with you 100. percent But it's still, I mean, it depends. It's such a subjective testing um, to test to grade someone's yeah, yeah. writing yeah. skills. Yeah. I mean, gra yeah, proper grammar. One writer, and one, one uh, grader can look at a paper and give it a four, you know a four or whatever how he, she scored, and another one could give it a three. Well. Well, how they do it with the uh, star test. Mm -hmm. As I'm, uh, from what I understand, is it's literally a cookie cutter thing. Well, so well you have to have your thesis, you have to have your main contention, supporting mm -hmm. example, and and you, it doesn't really matter what the content is, mm -hmm. so much as as Avu has those parts, which yeah. would lead to someone not being able to know how to put together yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. um, which eliminates so it's important for us, writers. I think, in, in, in our district to kind of ignore. While keeping in mind the state, mm -hmm. just Agreed. really focusing on making sure 
like Charles said, people come out of Pearland, mm-hmm. and and we, we do oh. already. I mean, I've seen it <laughs> phenomenally better than most other districts, mm-hmm. uh, but there's always room for improvement. I think yeah, that's I agree. What we I agree. Yeah. No, I agree with Mark. I agree. One hundred percent. So looking at AP, uh, Advanced Placement, which we've talked a little bit about already, um, this is our enrollment history. So as, as Ms. Giggy shared, it's continuing to increase um, our, our AP courses and our pre-AP. I think this is the very first year our pre-AP dropped a little bit, um, but like you're going to see in a little bit, our dual, and, uh, our dual credit is increasing. And so in, in some areas, uh, those students are just making different choices. When we look at the number of exams taken, and so uh, when Ms. Gingy talked about over that 10-year period, you can see that in 2008, we only had 757 exams taken. That students could take more more than one exam. And in 2017, we had almost 5,000 students. Yes, sir. Uh, Talking about, you know, we're talking about AP participation in the slide before. I I do want to say that um, I think it's imperative to our counselors that they and, I, and I'm not going to say that because it's always pushed AP, right? Push, 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 AP, 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 okay? Because that's what I heard from my daughter who graduated and my son and my other, that's AP, 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 right? And um, that's, like he brought up, that's good for a lot of kids, but it's not good for all kids. Mm-hmm. I just think our counselors need to understand that, you know, um, to explain it better to students and to parents because I, that's the one thing I get from parents all the time is when their child is a junior in high school or a sophomore in high school, they're going, well, my kid's just going to go to San Jacinto or my kid doesn't really need these, you know, mm-hmm. and so they don't, and they've struggled and been stressed out about these AP classes and they've struggled and got C's in them mm-hmm. and then they go off and they, 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 the school doesn't recognize, other recognizes that it's a class, right? Mm-hmm. And so by the NCAA standards, it's, right. so I just think more explanation by the counselors. I'm not saying that's your forte, but on the, I think that's important for us, for our counselors to help, especially starting younger mm-hmm. when they start in the seventh grade. That yeah. It's not for everybody, but it can help a lot uh, of people. And I, I think with the new graduation plan, foundation high school program with endorsements, I think those conversations are now happening okay. earlier and, and students have, and counselors have a vehicle to do that. Um, we talked to our seventh and eighth graders about the endorsements and the curriculum pathways. In ninth grade, every student uh, meets with their counselor to talk about their four-year plan. So I think that there's some more things in place um, that are a little bit more strategic okay. about looking at four-year no, plans. Let me add to that that the new accountability system, the latest iteration, uh, begins to give credit for career certifications and other areas that it didn't previously. That will drive more folks towards dual credit mm-hmm. and towards other uh, vocational type uh, offerings mm-hmm. once there's, there's muscle behind it, which is the accountability system. Mm-hmm. Um, looking at our AP scholars, uh, we had a, a significant increase in the third one, AP scholars with distinction. Uh, the school year went from 137 to 183. Uh, those are students that have an average score of 3.5 and a three or higher on five exams. So we're, we've got, you know, students, they're more than just taking one. They're, we've got even more students taking multiple exams. Is there a, um, oh, for, for earning those distinctions, I'm sorry, d- is um, the students, obviously, the, the work is its own reward, right? Mm-hmm. But is there... Is, is this the basis for like any scholarship competitions or anything like that? Uh, it depends on the scholarships. No. Uh, it depends on the university. No. Some, <laughs> I mean, they. It, it would, would be good to it. be able to put that on your okay. on on any college application okay. to say that I was an AP scholar with distinction. Okay. Uh, those are our participation rates um, globally, uh, and the state stayed the same. But you can see from 2016 to 17, we had a we had a big increase, and these are the the students that scored three or higher. You know, this is another incredible statistic. You've heard me say this every year. If you continue to increase the percentage of kids who are taking AP tests and yet you're able to maintain uh, or waver around there between 55 and 60 percent, that is awesome. Because yeah, generally, the bigger the pool, the this lower the results. Size, size that. that one's a so that's when you look at 2007 to 2017, we had 
500% increase or five times the number of students testing, but then also look at the number of passing AP exams. Like Dr. Tilly said, ours both are increasing. Um, typically, when you have a significant increase, your scores kind of dip a little bit because you're introducing more students that are newer to the, that coursework. Now, eventually, we're going to hit a cap. Absolutely. And when that happens, hopefully we'll continue to see performance increases. Continue to increase. Without having enrollment increases. Right. Okay. Right. That's a high bar. That's the goal. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Absolutely. But in an earlier slide, she showed how the pre-AP enrollment is beginning to plateau. I don't necessarily think of that as a bad thing because as Mike was saying and others, the dual credit is playing a more important role mm -hmm. uh, as we move forward. Yes. Um, we also have for ACT and SAT, uh, we have our most recent ACT performance. Uh, Texas went down just a little bit and we increased. We went from 22.8 up to an average of 23.1. So we saw an increase in ACT performance. When we look at SAT performance and participation, they don't have the official 2017 data yet. Usually comes out in November. Uh, so that is our data for 2016. Um, and so you can see again from 15 to 16, our student testing increased. Our overall average score went down a little bit, uh, but compared to the increase in the number of students participating, uh, we're still really, really proud of those results. The next slide I thought would be interesting, we may not have, have seen for 15-16, but when you look at Pearland average scores on SAT as compared to Texas and the total group, we still uh, have a higher average score so in, all, in all three areas. Is that what's meant by the global. total group? Yeah, total group is global. Okay. Now, do we have a breakdown, and I don't know if you know it's really in essential, but do we have a breakdown by campus? Yes, yes sir, uh, In fact, Charles asked for that, and, and I sent it at about right. 30 minutes before the meeting. Now, from what I understand, with all the factors, it's really kind of unreasonable to look and compare, especially turn to high school, Dawson High School. I mean, right. uh, totally different universes. Mm -hmm. um, so these averages... Is our, our district. Our district averages, mm -hmm. right. And then our, the, the last piece, uh, again, and this is the most up-to-date information that we have, is the total participation of ACT and SAT. So this is the graduating seniors that took either ACT or SAT. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Mary. But we fixed it. <laughs> we fixed it. But again, you know, I don't know if this is a trend. This is a guess on my part, but... When parents begin to look at the advantages of dual credit versus uh, four-year university, they start concentrating more on that state test to get into the junior college than they do on the SAT or ACT, mm -hmm. which can drop the percentage. I don't know if that's why, but that's possible. Jane, what's the name of the TSI? The TSI. Yep, TSI assessment. So when we look at uh, our enrollment in dual credit, you can see that we are, and, and I put projected because I, I calculated these at the beginning for our convocation, and so we'll see how many have stayed through the semester. Usually we lose a little bit, um, but we went from 28.17 last year to 32.48, so we had a pretty significant increase in the number of students in dual credit. So we asked, you know, why did pre-AP drop a little? You, you had a Out of how many students, are the high school students? Uh, we have about, oh, Sixteen hundred times four, yeah, ish. Right. How many? Sixteen hundred times four. So, what is that? Uh, about sixty-four hundred, something like that. That's right. Or sixty-four. And, and that's okay. one. That's one student. He may take. That's well. That's enrollment. So that's that's kind of like seat. So if a student's in three classes, they're counted three times. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we look at just a summary from the sixteen seventeen school year. We had 973 students earn a total of 3,123 credits in 42 different courses. Now, how does that compare to AP courses? How many uh, classes are offered there? Uh, I, it's not 42. Is it 34? 34 AP, yeah. Yeah, I mean, completely. Uh, Dr. Kelly, I mean, 
when we pushed, when we started Turner High School, I know that we were thinking about having uh, dual credit be a selective route for certain students. Mm -hmm. But um, from what I've seen, it, it would be amazing if every kid graduated from Pearland ISD with an associate's degree mm -hmm. and was able to jump into their junior year of college. Mm -hmm. Now, that may not be the route for everybody. That's a very ambitious, uh, a very ambitious very route. Ambitious. Very. But the uh, potential, the yield of that mm -hmm. would be incredible. Well, I mean and even some students that aren't, I mean, my own son is going to have 27 hours. Now, he's not going to have his associates, but he's going to have 27 yeah. hours of that core curriculum that he would typically need. So, yeah. you know, I think that, yes, associates may be the best, but there may be some courses that, depending on what they're doing after high school, they may not need. Right, right. You know, I haven't that. thought about it, uh, you know, in depth, Mike, but the new accountability system, which I think is still in the form of we can give input to the state mm -hmm. on certain measures within the domains, is calculating the um, – they're going to set a threshold for the number of college hours completed in order for you to get certain points towards your accountability system. And that's intriguing to me. For example, they might say, uh, what percentage of your graduating senior class has 12 or more hours of college credit? Mm -hmm. I think that's at least a way to get at it. Uh, the associate's degree, having two kids myself who went through Turner, is extremely ambitious, except if you're pretty bright and pretty hardworking from ninth grade on. Mm -hmm. It's pretty difficult. Right, but if we shoot high, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is probably one of my favorite slides, um, and Dr. Kelly mentioned this. And this in total is just, you know, looking at our dual credit and our AP exam of three or higher. Um, just in the 16-17 school year, we saved parents potentially almost $8 million in tuition costs um, based on the tuition and required fees at a Pretty ambitious figures, too, yeah. <laughs> Not the best school. There's other schools out there. <laughs> <laughs> we were all in harmony until that moment. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's true. It's so, not the best school. But I mean, I think overall we're we're headed towards world class. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a target that you ever reach. You know, because you want to continue growing and continue moving forward and raising that bar. Uh, but we but we definitely have amazing teachers, principals, administrators, staff, parents, students, uh, working together. To do uh, best for kids. Dr. Dr. Nixon, may I say that you have done an incredible job as dr uh, director of testing and evaluation. Thank you. Um, now we're giving you an even more challenging uh, position, but I know you will excel. Well, so, so the the isn't that so executive that director? Is that the executive director? Do you yes, sir. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nixon. I had one other question yes, that sir. I forgot about on the campus performance objectives. When you mentioned that all of our campus met, um, all of our campuses met the Standard. accountability standards. That means that we hit our targets for growth. That's, that means the, the index that for a state accountability. So sta okay. each campus met index one, two, three, and four Okay. for state accountability. State. Does that mean that we met it all for our local no. campus no. performance no. objectives? No. no. Okay. That's because where our star incentive pay is based. Because uh, to summarize that, uh, in order, Charles, to, to reach our own met standard, we, we need to go one-fifth of the way between that score and 100% right. passing. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 And so, yeah. obviously, you guys keep track of that and where you where you made your yes. biggest gains. And, and mm -hmm. so, you, you know, allocate and resources that way. Right. And when we meet okay. with principals on that campus accountability plan, that's another piece that we talk about. So, okay. you know, we look at accountability. We look at performance overall. So, how did you compare on distinctions with those campuses similar to you? How did you compare against yourself? those campus performance objectives for each of the student groups. Okay. Um, and so those accountability plans are still pretty much where we get our day-to-day -day marching orders on how we're going to, okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and our very last item, or are we ready? Okay. Uh, overview of bond project costs. Um, the intention of this uh, was an answer to a request from the board uh, last month or last two months that we um, show basically where we're at. And um, basically what, what you see is all good news so far in, in the areas that we can say, you know, with definite knowledge that we know, okay, this is how much it's going to cost. A whole bunch of that obviously is not yet known. Um, uh, Charles wrote me about the IT area. 
And what you see on that page there in 73, basically I had our construction folks, John and Don, uh, put this together, so they didn't really address that. That's a separate thing. That's yeah, um, and I, I wrote that um, question incorrectly when I first sent it in, so, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I think the, the bottom line with this is this should give the board reassurances that so far we're in good shape. Uh, I would also say that I'd love to see us continue to be in good shape and actually finish these projects significantly under budget. I'm not at all projecting that, but if we did, remember back to when you got to spend $35 million on Pearland High School, uh, Lahan and, and, and uh, uh, Carlston. Um, it's good to hold on to those funds and use them as needs come up. So um, I'm I may be getting ahead of myself, you know, but Hurricane Harvey, as uh, I think you saw in the very end of your packet, uh, there's a prediction by PBK in terms of what they think that might do to the market over the next few years. So I'll shut up there. Uh, any questions you might have for John or myself or, or anybody? Uh, <coughs> I have, um, you know, y'all, I had originally said something. We had our, uh, I think, a workshop. Um, we had um, uh, give a great, awesome, beautiful for Pearland High School combining that front. I never heard anything back on the cost of to change the front to match that beautiful entrance that we're combining. We just said they were going to bring that back. Is that something that still going to bring back to us? We still will. We're going to price that as an alternate, okay. as, a, as a few different alternates. So w when will we see the alternate type stuff? The the pricing on that does not come. We'll see it at the – we're planning to bring that to the February board meeting. Okay. So yeah. all th – these are alternate projects? Yes, we've got – we've got that for? Well, what we do is we price what we call the base bid, uh -huh. and that's just keeping the facade as it is. And then we'll we'll have a couple different additive alternates to add the different components, the the overhang shade, the brick pilasters, and the metal panel. So we should have three alternates for that. And so that it, and that's just for Pearland. Does that come for, with other projects too? There are alternates on most of these projects okay. to, to to cover different things where we're not sure either that we want to do them or we're going to have the money to do them. Sure. So this gives us a chance to see what the market pricing is for those. And then we can make the decision. So whatever whatever those come back at, we'll make the recommendation to the board so you all have a chance to, you know, you'll have the opportunity to approve all those alternates. So, for instance, it, and I'm using the Pearland High School one because that's the one we talked about. <clears throat> so the, the entrance, whatever it was, and then I, we suggested that it's going to be additional money to change the front of it to make it look all the same, right, as the entrance? Correct. So if you we, will see a, um, we will see a – alternate design that because we only saw a little oh now you know what lance i think you missed the meeting where he brought back pictures of each of the three i, I only missed one so i think that's right because I, I think i remember mm -hmm. thinking oh this is something important to lance so when we do get okay. back to this sorry about we that. bring it forward with the illustrations and show uh the work you've done there yeah. okay sorry. Bring it back. in the meantime maybe john we email lance what absolutely those uh, those different looks. I'm just doing my I'm just gonna put a square that was wrong. <laughs> okay, so you'd say February for alternate designs and things, okay. Thank In you. February we'll bring back the uh, GMP, recommending a GMP for Pearland High School, yes. Any questions, board? Okay. I I got a couple of things, Mr. Posh. And if you need to get back to me on any of this, no problem. We're kinda sure. Sure. All right, I know we still have some work going on at Carlson. Do we still have work going on at Lawn as well? Okay, uh, John and Don are not in charge of the oh, old That's the stuff. old bond. Okay. Yeah, that'd I be mean Mr. old bond money. Okay. Mr. Berger, if he's here, still here. Oh, he Lawrence, we can talk later. Don't worry about it. Uh, Larry, <laughs> how are we doing? <laughs> and I, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but how are we doing in terms of final cost for Carlson, Lawhon, and Pearland? Anything left? Or, or final date. Is this? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Berger. I appreciate that. Okay. Now, for the lighting at the rig, the um, 
Yeah. Okay. The uh, we got the initial lighting in, and then we came in with the um, the uh, temporary lighting. Was there an additional cost to us for the temp- temporary lighting? Yes, and I believe this is the one that we just got a price for. Okay, they came but out of M and L. But okay. uh, you had a figure for that, didn't you, Larry? At some point, you you gave me a figure for that. How much we we were spending on the additional lighting beyond the. F- okay. 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 As part of the bond, the forty-three thousand. It will be. Yeah. So, so with the lighting at the rig, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't want to bring up a sore subject. But um, you know, first off, let me just say this: when the rig was built many moons ago, the idea to put those lights right there was a terrible idea. Okay, period. Um, and the fact that we don't want to move the lights because right now, whatever sport it is. Or whatever activity is going on, if you look, if you look up, you're blinded on the field. I was down there, and it's not not good. So, you know, trying to catch whatever a baton or a, you know, whatever it is, and it hits that light, it's just not good. And so that's why most people, most stadiums have the lighting behind the stadium, so it projects down, and it doesn't necessarily get always in your eyes now i was down on the field and i know everybody's talking about the lighting that comes down on the stands and and i was but i was down on the field again i looked up it's still pretty dark but i know there's a, a significant cost to move the poles and i heard that but you know if we're not if we're going to try and fix the rig up and not build another stadium like most other districts are doing and i think we need to do it right while we have bond money and if it's going to be additional cost, let's do it right the first time instead of trying to. But but let me let me, uh, Lance, were you able to go to this last Friday yes, night's game? Yes, I was there. Okay, because oh, no, it's, it's on the field. It's a lot lot better. It's, it's a lot better, better, but it ain't, it's still not very good. And and when remember, we still have the design of the press box to go, and uh, I think that that will also give us uh, some additional capabilities. I I don't know the price of missing the or of of moving the four poles, but I'm guessing it's. Huge. Two hundred thousand. It's more than that. How much? Way more. The the price to replace the poles where they are currently. The original price when we got in was about seven hundred ninety-eight thousand. To move the poles behind or the rig. Or to move or to cut them and re put them on the back. Or to move the to move the yeah. poles from where they are was more than the budget that we had. There's it was seven hundred ninety-six thousand to replace the poles where they are, to get new poles to where they are currently located. To price them to get them behind the rig was more than the budget line item that we had so in the bond. We're gonna, re- we're not replacing those poles. No. Or we have replaced the, them. The lights are already up, sir. No, the lights. I know the are lights up. are up on the poles that were existing, correct? Yes, sir. The new lights. The quote from Musco was seven hundred ninety-eight thousand to replace that pole. To replace that pole and with new lights. In its current position, though, not move the pole, just not move new them poles in their current location. Was seven hundred ninety-eight thousand. To cut those and add poles in the back was you, was, was more added, than was more than the budget millions, that we had. Probably several million. I, I don't know. Would be my guess. Well, I wasn't. You got to move everything. I wasn't quite going down that road with with my question, um, but when <laughs> when you mentioned, <laughs> I was. <laughs> no, I know you got to do. Uh, when you mentioned my my uh, my concern was what the additional cost was because I know we didn't plan to replace the lights and then put up temporary lights. And so my concern was how that affects your budget for for maintenance. Are there, you know, there's other things down the road that we spent fifteen thousand dollars there that we can't, you know. We have done a pretty good job this year of cost saving analysis. We've reworked okay. our chiller maintenance contract and our okay. custodial contract, so it's not an impact to so us right now. You're, you're okay, no, okay, good. I was we, there, like I said, there is another design coming from Musco to get halo lighting as well as at the baseball and softball field for the bullpens mm. and so it'll be about 43,000 of additional bond money that we'll okay. be asking for. And that light, those lights will go, I know this is way ahead of it, those, <coughs> those lights will go some at the rig, some at the baseball, some at 
Yes, sir. Some at softball? Yes, sir. They okay. will cover first and third base for baseball and softball for the bullpens. Okay. And then they will cover the halos and the track at the rig. Okay. The, the okay. error that I think I made in this whole thing, Charles, was um, basically we decided let's get ahead on the lights because it will help the athletes on the field. And we moved quicker than, remember, if you know, think about the sound, which we have not changed, mm -hmm. and the whole rest of the additional seats and all that, we're going to go through the usual planning process. Mm -hmm. But we thought, you know, we can – we can get ahead of this and we can solve the lighting. But people were so used to the stadium lighting being better that we concentrated our energies on the field. And, you know, if we'd have been a little bit slower and, and, and thought this out, I think we would have avoided that it's too dark and, and, and all that. I, d I don't know that we would have, though, because if we had ended up with the product that we have and the way that it is, it would still have ended in the same result. I think what my biggest fear of the whole thing is is this is our really kind of first completed project and in my opinion it's a band-aid i mean really and that's all it is it's just a band-aid um and, and i know that was not our intentions and that was i think that was probably not me there's others too just from the very beginning like i don't want to do something half mm -hmm. and not do it right and mm -hmm. i feel that that's where we've ended up with this project and even if we go back and I'm really fearful of the whole renovation now at the rig. And that only because um, if you just add on, to, if you add on to the, just talk about the press box, you add on to that, you're only, you're not going to gain what, what you want to project as your image of your premier piece of property in the district. Yeah. It's only going to be, same thing, another Band-Aid on, on a situation. It is not to the current standards of what anybody else is doing in any vicinity in the state of Texas. It's just not. So for us to spend the amount of money that we did on the lights, and I've been on the field, the lights are 100% definitely better, not as shadowy on the field as they were before. But they're not good in the rest of the stadium. When you're sitting in the stands looking at the field, it still looks very shadowy. There's The poles weren't right to begin with. We probably shouldn't have put the lights on those poles. We should have just not done the project, in my personal personal opinion. So whether some everybody agrees with me, it's, it's all right. But it did. I mean, it temporarily fixed one problem, created another problem that we're going to have to go back and fix. I think that would have been the problem no matter what. Well, um, I, I, and if we do add lights to... The, if when we remodel, if we do go forward with the remodel of the press box and you add lights for the stands, I still just don't think that the end result of what we're going to get is going to be what we hope to gain by doing the remodel. Well, I, I, I'll agree to, with you to a certain extent, Pam, but really I'm trying to show you that I handed this project over to maintenance and operations and said, I think we can fix the lights up front. That gives the, the fans an idea that improvements are coming and so on. And so we did it that way. I didn't go through the careful engineering and all the other kinds of steps that probably we would have gone if we'd have looked at this as a total project. So I really, the part I want to disagree with you is don't judge all the rest of the $220 million stuff that we've got ongoing as this is the first fruit of that. This was an attempt to get ahead of things. And we will make those lights right. Well, I'm, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on what. That's the thing. I mean, it's still it will be better. Don't get me wrong, but it's not going to be to the standard that. I well, we'll see. That I, I, I just so we'll I, see. I'm gonna piggyback on what Pam said, and this is my since day one. Everybody passes the bond, and they want to see. You know what they've spent their money on, and they want to see. And they may not agree with what we decide on all the time, but I'll tell you what, if they have something that they're proud of, they'll be brag they'll be the first one to brag about it. And that's just something that and I know in the rig and people say, Oh, well it's all about football. It's not about football. That is the that is the the one piece of property that we have that is used by the whole community all year long. And it's it's the most used piece of property that we have. And and we need to take care of it or we're ten years down the road. We're going to be trying to fix something else on it. And so I, I, I'm i in favor of if we need to add more money to make it right this one time, so for the next 15, 20 years, we're proud of it and we're looking at it, hey, I'm all for that too. But I don't want to put a lipstick on a pig like I've always said, you know? I think we have heard that message, uh, Lance. And yeah. What I think that translates to is now, obviously, the rig is not the top priority for us right now. 
the Dawson High School and some of the overcrowded. Dan. But when we do bring that to you, you know, the, the message you gave earlier and so did other board members is they'd like to see alternates on the rig. Okay. They'd like to see us go beyond the basics. And so the board will still be in a position to choose among uh, those potential okay. al alternates. Thank you. Just an another question on the construction cost. Um, the, the positive variances you're seeing in the construction cost, uh, do we expect those to stay when we're looking at the the impact of the recent storms on construction materials? Uh, it's a good question. The Harvey is a little bit of a wild card, so we're not sure what the impact is going to be. Mm -hmm. Most likely they're going to go up, so that will tighten, tighten things up tighten on the construction costs. Okay. And are, are we – we're not cutting scope for Correct. to to achieve any of these savings, right? Correct. I mean, we I are we delivering the bond scope. Okay. Okay. Every every item on there. All right. I didn't have anything. Else. I do thank the board because if you remember back before we even went forward with the election, at the last minute you guys added in an additional sort of contingency there, which I think we are, are really feeling the benefit of. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Okay. Any other questions, board? No. Okay. All right. That's it then, right? So this meeting is adjourned at 8.10 p.m.